Good morning guys, Stephen from James Glenn Castles with another episode of Jimmy Glenn's Candid Random Car Review. Uh, I skipped the drive in this morning because it is literally blown a hooli for those of you who aren't Scottish, that is it's exceptionally windy today so it probably wouldn't have been a good sound quality event. Anyway, we are at the garage and the guys have set out something for me today to road test. And here it is. Now this has been pretty much the benchmark go to do everything hot hatch for a number of years. Uh, the Mark 7.5 is also regarded as peak golf um, by many. Do you agree? Personally, I do. I think the Mark 7.5 is definitely on point, but there is an underlying discussion and whether or not the Golf R is all that it's cracked up to be. The folk that have got it absolutely love it. The people that don't get it just think that it's pretty much overhyped and makes lots of parp and daft noises out of the exhaust and most of the owners do needless exhaust uh, gear changes up and down to demonstrate their parpiness out of the exhaust. So today we're going to be uh, having a, basically having a look around, um, just seeing what the car's all about. We'll take out a drive, we'll see what it's like to drive. Uh, but first of all, let's get a nose round and just see what the car uh, presents like on the inside and on the outside. So I don't think anybody can say that that's not a pretty car, especially the Mark 7.5 with the revised headlights. Um, one thing that I've always found about the Mark, uh, in fact, pretty much any Golf R when sat next to a Golf GTI is they are quite, they're quite, they're quite plain. You know, for example, the Golf GTI, um, it carries this chrome bit in red and, and it, you know, and it's through into the headlights, whereas this is all rather it's all rather subtle. If anything, you would have thought that the, you know, the top of the line, 300 brake horsepower, all-wheel drive derivative would have jumped, you know, would have stood out a wee bit more um, by comparison to the GTI uh, counterpart. However, that was a decision made by VW for whatever reason. But when we move round to the back, instead of the Golf GTI's two exhaust pipes, we have four. On this particular car, we do actually have a very, very, very rare factory fitted Akrapovich exhaust. Now, this brings to, to another question. Is it Akrapovich or is it Akrapovich? I would really, really like to know because I have got friends that have been debating this with me for years. Let me know in the comments. Um, so yeah, as I say, so really nice proportion. You know, at the end of the day, golf has always been the benchmark regardless of whether it's something you want that's practical whether it's something you want that it's good in fuel, you'd buy the TDI. If you want something that's fast, you buy the GTI. And then the Golf R is obviously the, re the replacement for the flagship R32. On the inside, the Mark 7.5 does uh, really lift the cabin. It's all nice and glossy. Um, the screen has a sort of iPad appearance to it. Sorry guys, you'll need to excuse this car. It's not been validated yet, so it's a wee bit dusty there. Uh, so the infotainment is much, much nicer. We've also got the introduction of the virtual cockpit, um, which replaces the old analog dials. Uh, and in this car, it's a DSG gearbox, um, which <coughs> is exceptionally effective. Uh, I've always found that, if anything, um, the DCT, so not DCT, sorry, uh, the DSG is almost too good. You actually hardly even feel um, the gear changes where, uh, if you compare it with something as I just mentioned a moment ago, the DCT actually feel the gear change, which I actually prefer. Uh, I like to feel that the car's actually doing something when you change the gear rather than just the rev counter dropping. However, as far as <coughs> performance goes, uh, you certainly can't argue that it's a very, very effective gearbox. Um, so we'll, um, I'll just chop it here. Uh, we'll get it started and we'll see what the car sounds like on cold start, especially with that lovely, a crap, a crap, a crap. Fancy aftermarket exhaust, which comes factory fitted on this example. Back in a tick. Alrighty, you've got the mic set up. And we'll give it a wee start and see what it sounds like on cold start. Not really much to go off just right now. I mean, it doesn't exactly fire up and give you any goosebumps. Go you Rev. Got a wee bit of a, just a wee slight burble just on over and I don't want to rev it too too hard with it being cold. So that's our cold start video done. Now let's take the car out, 
see what it's like on the road. Why would you buy a Golf R? Well, I suppose it's not really a case of why would you buy a Golf R, it's more a case of why wouldn't you buy a Golf R because really, on paper, it's 300 brake horsepower. They are endlessly reliable if looked after and not mapped to absolute smithereens. That being said, they do handle that sort of treatment exceptionally well. They, they're a great looking car. The interior is lovely, it's all made from nice materials. Tech levels, excellent from standard. Uh, I mean, they even come with adaptive uh, adaptive cruise control. I think the problem with the Golf R is they do have a bit of a stigma. Now, if you remember back to when these cars came out, you could buy a brand new Golf R for £299 a month and a similar deposit. Now, <laughs> I don't remember exactly down to the penny how much the cars cost, but I'm pretty sure they were somewhere around 30 grand. And because they were so cheap on the monthly PCPs, they were everywhere. In fact, you've seen more, I'm going to turn that stop start off because I hate it. Um, you've seen more of these on the road than you've seen of the underdog, the Golf GTI. Now, the Golf GTI is cheaper, so therefore, you would think that you would see more of them. But herein lies the issue in the wonderful world of PCP land. The residual value was stronger on the dearer car, which meant the bit you paid in the middle was smaller, which meant that your payments were lower. And because they were everywhere, they kind of, it kind of ruined, in my humble opinion, it kind of robbed the Golf R of what it really should be. And if you think back to the old Golf R32, if back in the day, if you seen someone in a Golf R32 or even a VR6, you would think, yeah, that guy's pushed himself on a bit. He, he's a proper petrol head because that car's expensive. It's expensive to run. It's expensive to tax. But that guy or that girl is in the car that they want. Fast forward to the car that replaced it, the Golf R, and that was not the case. Everyone was in one because it was faster and it was cheaper, so of course, why not? Don't know why my voice went squint, it's all, all, all squeaky, squeaky there. So, in a way, it kind of robbed the Golf R of what it really should have been, and that's something that should be kind of really see on the roads, the flagship, the top end model, but it wasn't. Now, the flip side of that is, there is an abundance of them for sale. So, finding one isn't very difficult. Finding one that's not been tuned, that's a different uh, kettle of fish. Now, I'm pretty sure these cars have what's known as the EA Treble 8, two liter inline, four cylinder turbocharged engine, which produces around about 300 brake horsepower. Um, it's really responsive, it's got great mid range, it revs well. The sound is, it's all right. Uh, we've had these cars with intakes and bits and bobs, which does make them sound an awful lot more interesting, but in standard trim, yeah, you get fake engine noise pumped in through the car, which, as far as I can tell, tries to make it sound like a five-cylinder, which, just no. But, we've got 300 brake horsepower, we've got four-wheel drive, and a practical hatchback, which comes in either three or five doors. So really, I mean, there really shouldn't be much to dislike about the Golf R, other than it's slightly tainted image, shall we say, which was not the car's fault because, I mean, ultimately, these are actually really, really good. So we will start off, now that we're out of the town, um, with a speed test. So we'll get the car into all its fancy bits. So we've got driver's modes. So we've got eco, we'll not be using that today, comfort, normal, and race. So we've got it in race, we'll put the car into manual. We'll slow down to about 10 miles an hour should do it. Um, yeah, we'll get in it first. And off we go. Yeah, 
that's that's impressive. And I have to say that the spread of power is literally constant. Um, there's, 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 you do get a little bit of lag, but I mean, it's literally, it, it, if anything, I like a bit of lag because it makes you feel like the car is actually turbocharged. Pretty sure these cars do come with quite a substantial old turbo on them, so that it's, it's, it's you know it's capable of shifting a fair bit of air. Hence why you know when people do go stage two, you can get as much as 420 brake horsepower with just simple bolt-on modifications. Um, so we'll get on a, a, a nicer bit of road. We'll start giving it some uh, some input and steering, uh, and we'll see how it feels. So it's not too fair to compare this with a standard car because as I mentioned it does have the Akrapovich exhaust but we're now on the country road to see what it's like on the brakes and on the steering. Bit of acceleration at the corner. Is, it's a point and squirt car. It really, it, it, I can't really say much more than that in terms of the handling because you know, you, I dare say eventually you'll probably start to experience um, some understeer. But on the road, you're not going to get to the, the, the you're not going to get to that level, um, or you shouldn't be getting to that level to experience that. It's just an extremely, extremely sure-footed car. Uh, I'm not really feeling much through the, the steering wheel in terms of feedback. Um, I'm just letting this car get ahead a wee bit. Um, but it's nicely weighted. It's not exceptionally darty when you're turning in either. I mean, it's, it's quite lazy at the front end by comparison to other cars that I've driven. Uh, rides, rides good. We're really beginning to pop and bang out this exhaust now. Obviously, it's, now it's getting a bit of heat into it. going to pull over a wee second and let the car in front get ahead because it doesn't make for a particularly interesting road type road test following a Kia estate car. Um, so move on to the cabin. The cabin in the Mark 7.5 really has moved. I mean the architecture is essentially the same but we've got an entirely new infotainment. It's all nice and glossy. Um, you know the screen blends in nice with the surrounds so it's not the older one. The old Mark 7 just looked like I had a head unit plonked in the middle of some rather um, basic plastic. As I mentioned earlier, we've got the virtual cockpit, which is really outdates the old model instantly. Uh, so much nicer to have. The paddles are all right. Um, I preferred the ones in the M140, to be honest, because these feel more like buttons than actual paddles. Nice steering wheel, nice thickness, nice layout, nice thin spokes, flat bottom. Um, gearbox, again, as I was saying earlier on, we've got the DSG in this, which is exceptionally effective albeit you don't really quite get the, the mechanical shove of like a DCT. Um, yeah, so anyway, I think we've got a clear road ahead. Let's go out and see what the car's like along the rest of this road. Back in the manual. This car doesn't have the adaptive chassis control it's just on a standard passive damper which i have to say is riding these bumps pretty good i think we I think we actually oh, big puddle i think we actually need to do with this car it is as you're turning in you need to have the boost just ready um, and then when the boost comes in as you're turning in you actually start to feel the front end wakening up and um, if you're just turning in off boost if it feels like it's carrying some weight over the front end, which literally disappears as soon as you start getting some power through the front. Try here, just make sure there's none coming. Yeah, definitely. So to get that front axle working properly, you need to obviously apply some torque, which is something that just takes a wee bit of time to get the knack of. So the Mark 7.5 Golf R, I would have to say it's probably one of the most complete packages that you can buy. Um, it handles well. Uh, it's maybe not the last words in handling dynamics, but you still can't argue the fact that the car does handle well. It's not a car I think you're going to find yourself getting into any, pro any, tr any, any trouble with due to the very n natural handling 
characteristics of the chassis. Um, what I have noticed is that it does feel much, much nicer um, when you're applying steering angle with boost because you start to feel the front end actually doing something. Um, tuning possibilities for these cars is pretty much endless and they do seem to handle it very, very well. Interior is nice and grown up. We've got a nice this T TFT virtual cockpit. The, the, the infotainment's lovely. Um, they come loaded with loads of standard kit. You know, this car's got as standard heated seats, nav, virtual cockpit, LED headlights, and even adaptive uh, cruise control. So it's not a case of, you know, getting one like the old Mark 7 where you would get lots of basic cars out there without even heated seats. These cars do come fairly well loaded um, as standard. So yeah, um, great car, really, really good package. If you're wanting one car to pretty much do it all, then I don't think you'd be disappointed with the Mark 7.5 Golf R. Thanks very much for watching till the end. Uh, if you've enjoyed the video, please subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. If you've got any questions or if there's anything that you disagree or I agree with in the video, please leave it in the comments. It'd be good to have a wee chat. Thanks very much and I'll see you in the next one.